Hello, uh, welcome back. Uh, today's topic is uh, multi-cycle implementation of uh, our scaled down version of uh, MIPS processor which we call M MIPS. Think of it as micro MIPS or mini MIPS. So, why multi-cycle? Previously, we have seen single cycle data path and uh, although it was quite simple to evolve, understand uh, and uh, analyze, there are obvious drawbacks of uh, single cycle data path. Single cycle data path implementation of MIPS. The most striking drawback was uh, that uh, even for low latency instructions uh, which would have finished their uh, which would have finished computing the results very early in the clock cycle, uh, though even those instructions would have to wait until the end of the longish clock cycle to commit their results into somewhere some of the state elements, memory elements like registers or uh, memory blocks. Uh, so, for example, a low latency instruction such as jump, unconditional jump. Okay. Uh, it would have uh, it would have uh, found this uh, decoded the instruction, found the target address very quickly, very early in the clock cycle, but then it has to uh, to it has to wait until the end of the clock cycle uh, because we are having edge triggered uh, synchronous sequential circuit. It has to wait until the end of the clock cycle, which is quite long wait, until it commits the results. Before which the other instruction cannot start. Next instruction cannot start. So a low latency instruction uh, would have for computed the results computed the result, which in this case it simply means it would have simply found decoded the uh, decoded the instruction and found the target address where to jump to unconditionally and it would be now ready to load that target address into the program counter. Uh, but uh, it has to wait. Early during the clock cycle this would have result would have been computed, but long wait this which is wasteful until end of the clock cycle. Okay. So, this is quite a waste of time of course, the, uh, how long the cycle has clock cycle has been defined to be or designed to be would have depended on the longest latency instruction. In this, in the case of micro MIPS, we have seen that it would be the instruction load word where which has to kind of go through several phases, fetching the instruction, then decoding it, then computing the uh, address of, of the memory from where to load from. For that, it would use the ALU, then accessing the memory block, and then uh, after the memory block returns the data, committing the uh, result into the appropriate register in the register file. So, this is one this is the longest apparently the longest running instruction and the clock cycle would have been designed to be long enough for uh, for such a long running instruction and but uh, for, for low latency instructions like jump or uh, un, or conditional branches like most of this uh, CPU cycle is going to go west or even for little for faster instructions than load say store or say register ALU type instructions like add or add immediate. The work will be done fairly early in the clock cycle, fair little before quite uh, early enough before the end of the clock cycle, but there will be a, a wasteful wait until the end of the clock cycle for committing the results. Committing up by that I mean putting the results back into appropriately uh, chosen like registers or memory block maybe. For example, store instruction would be committing the result into one of the uh, 
speci specified locations in the memory block data memory. So, this is a drawback like right? there is a wastage of time okay? and the reason was that this, uh, this the length of the clock cycle the duration of the clock cycle was chosen to be long enough to accommodate the execution or processing of the longest running instruction like load word. Other instructions had plenty of time, but uh, had just to wait. So, uh, what we the way to think about it is that uh, the continuous time has been discretized or quantized into uh, very coarse, very big chunks of uh, clock cycle. A, a chunk is a clock cycle of a specific duration. The duration is a bit too long okay, for many instructions. So, this discretization of time into uh, clock cycle has been a bit too coarse, bit too wasteful uh, in the in case of single cycle implementation. So, that is what we want to uh, overcome. So, the natural way to overcome is uh, uh, like you know to uh, improvise on this would be to use uh, smaller chunks you know to discretize the time, quantize the time into smaller cl uh, duration clock cycle that means, faster clock is at, at a faster frequency. So, natural approach, natural improvisation would be discretized time into smaller duration clock cycles. that is faster frequency clock signal. So, now definitely like uh, because say we are now going to be planning to use 4 times faster clock or 5 times faster clock uh, like uh, these long running instructions like load word would not be able to finish in a single clock cycle. Every dif different kind of instructions are going to require different amount of time. So, uh, uh, load word would require 5 clock cycles let us say. Uh, unconditional jump can finish execution in 2 of 2 such uh, short clock cycles and so on. So, different instructions now different instructions would require different number of clock cycles, may require different number of clock cycles, such short clock cycles. For example, as I mentioned, we hope that we can get load word, uh, we will see that uh, shortly, it will require 5 clock cycles. I will we'll just uh, describe how exactly. We will get this unconditional jump to finish in 2 clock cycle. So, obviously, number of clock cycles seems to be more, uh, but then the uh, duration of each clock cycle is uh, proportionately shorter, maybe 4 times, 5 times, whatever. There will be a little bit of overhead, but uh, so you know, but what we are uh, uh, saving on is a lot of waste that would have occurred in to low latency instructions like jump or branch and so on. So, let us see more details about this. So, uh, first so on side note no, uh, just note that we have been talking about uh, edge triggered synchronous that is sync single clock sequential circuit. to implement uh, m mips okay this uh, this the methodology of clocking methodology of using uh, edge trigger synchronous sequential circuit is uh, something that that makes a lot of design the whole design process implementation process extremely uh, extremely uh, algorithmic and uh, synthesis process efficient and uh, 
easily analyzable, easily verifiable. So, there are a lot of adva advantages of this over the asynchronous methodology. So, we have kind of without any further questions, we are going to assume that we are using edge triggered synchronous sequential circuit and that is the reason uh, we are uh, talking in terms of clock cycles. Okay. The time is discretized into uh, multiple clock cycles. Uh, so, updates of the so called state of computation. So, this is a very uh, I am using this notion very vaguely the state of computation. The state of computation which is stored in the registers. Uh, and memory uh, memory blocks that state of computation is getting updated only at end of the clock cycles only ha happening at the end of the clock cycle because that's where the uh, tr a triggering edge uh, is there that is at the clock synchronizing clock. So, it could be if you are using the negative edge trigger discipline it could be at the falling edge or it could be at the rising edge if you are using the, the positive edge trigger discipline. Okay. So, this is uh, and as I remarked before this state of computation that uh, BIPS is carrying out is stored in is held in registers, memory blocks and so on, register file. Okay. Next, uh, so the, one of the things that we want to highlight uh, through this case study of micro MIPS and multi cycle implementation is that it is a very important example of uh, the concept called FSM plus data path, FSM with data path, FSMD. Our multi cycle implementation is going to be a case study of it, FSM plus data path. So, we will not very rigorously very formally uh, like highlight the FSM uh, uh, aspect of it, but we will very clearly see there is an FSM controller controlling the so called data path. Data path as we have uh, remarked on data path is a collection of data path components which process or route the data and the with how which how the data is going to be processed, how the data is to be routed or stored or latched is controlled by a controller and that controller is a uh, is a typical FA, is an F good interesting example of an FSM. Overall, the whole uh, computer itself is an FSM, of course. But then the concept of state means all the, that has been stored in the memory, which might be relevant for future computation. That becomes the notion of state, which is a bul much bulkier notion of state. And uh, so, one typically like, likes to think of the core notion of state and core state machine core FSM and the uh, the data processing part uh, like you know left to the data path uh, part of the sequential circuit. So, the whole FSM plus data path can be regarded as a huge FSM, but uh, that is impractical to study or impractical to like analyze. So, this is the typical partition of uh, a sequential circuit into a, a core controller and a core data path. So, that is what we will be emphasizing through this case study. So, uh, so there is I uh, will be using this 
notion or terminology instruction cycle and instruction sub cycle. Instruction cycle is the sequence of or of clock cycles. Uh, required uh, or during which an instruction is getting processed. And uh, in, a, in case of the multi cycle implementation, uh, the instruction cycle will consist of a number of clock cycles and each one of this clock cycle I will refer to it as instruction sub cycle. Instruction sub cycle are those individual clock cycles of instruction cycle. In this individual uh, uh, clock cycles, in this instruction sub cycle, there will be something sp specific happening, you know. So, uh, that we have to uh, clearly plan for, clearly define, and, and then what are the results of those sub operations, where are they archived, who is going to use them, that is what we will be, uh, that architecture we will be designing in this lecture. Okay. So, what are this, uh, uh, what is happening? In, inside instruction during instruction sub cycles. Let us use our intuitive understanding of uh, CPU architectures uh, from prior courses or something that you, this you might have seen before, but let us recall. So, what is happening inside instruction sub cycles? Sub operations, okay? some well defined sub operations. And uh, as your natural guess would be, the, well, the sub operations would be like in this context fetch sub operation, decoding of instruction and uh, reading the operands, operands from register file that will be a sub operation, which will have concurrency within that. Uh, next will be typically the uh, arithmetic or logic execution for whatever reason. It, if it is an add instruction, then the in this stage the operands which have been read in the previous stage would be added up and the result will be prepared and archived somewhere. In case of memory or load store instructions. Uh, this particular stage will be calculating the memory address. Uh, following this, if needed, there will be a stage of memory access sub operation. Here, memory is accessed for the data, uh, whereas in the fetch case, also memory is accessed, but that is accessed for the instruction. Uh, following this, optionally, like uh, in some in some cases or few instruction cycles, there will be a stage sub operation called write back. So, this is the st uh, uh, stage where like uh, certain kind of uh, results are being stored back into registers. Okay. Yeah. So, it is a kind of commit stage, it is not that uh, this is the only stage in which results get committed, the results might be getting committed in earlier stages also for different operations, but this is the most typical uh, commitment stage committing these results. So, clearly uh, not every uh, every instruction cycle would go through all the sub operations. Clearly for example, if it is just a unconditional jump instruction, then it would go through fetch sub operation, it would also go through decoding or sub, sub operation, it may not have make any sense to read anything out of the register file for that instruction, but yes it will have to kind of break up the instruction and look at the target address, do some kind of you know uh, the processing of that, get the uh, like extract the target address and then arrange to load it back into the program counter. That is the commitment part of unconditional jump, which must be happening in the second clock cycle, it is uh, second sub operation itself. So, 
since first clock cycle of unconditional jump we will be doing the phase sub operation in the second uh, clock cycle of the instruction cycle of unconditional jump we will be doing the decoding which will essentially be understanding that it is a jump instruction and it also extracting the target address and that target address would be uh, registered into the program counter. So, that is the commitment part for which it may not need to wait for the write back special stage. The, in the second clock cycle itself uh, while decoding extracting target address at the end of that clock cycle uh, program counter can be updated. So, depends. So, this is our intuitive view of what sub operations are and uh, like you know uh, every one of them is going to require typically uniform similar amount of time. So, we have uh, will be allocating one clock cycle for every such sub operation. So, in case of like I said in case of unconditional jump the, the instruction cycle will con consist of two clock cycles two sub cycles for this two sub operations fetch and decoding and while decoding girls at the end of decoding immediately committing in the same clock cycle. In case of some longer latency int instructions like store word the instruction cycle will go through all the five sub, sub operations and there will be five clock cycles required for that. That is how uh, that is why we remarked earlier that uh, in the multiple cycle we will hope to or we will aim at doing something in the five clock cycle something in two clock cycles appropriately making more efficient use of time which is discretized in smaller quantas. So, that was an intuitive picture how we had already planned to break up uh, instruction cycle into sub cycles and each sub cycle will be doing approximately what. Yeah, so, we can now uh, think in terms of uh, an FSM, FSM diagram. Let us see how to capture what we have been thinking about what we have been analyzing about this. So, it is like uh, we can regard this uh, sub cycle sub operations uh, happening in different clock cycles as uh, like you know controlled by different states of the controller. So, there is a state called fetch or I will abbreviate it by f. This is the state that CPU goes into when it starts execution because it has to start fetching an instruction and then decoding it executing it optionally doing memory access write back and so on. Now, after doing its work in the fetch states of uh, the controller this uh, the state machine or what a controller would go into a state called where in which it would control the decode related operations decode or reading the operands or in some cases immediately after decoding putting the target address into the program counter all this will be con uh, all such control signals will be generated in this uh, state depending on the situation. So, what is the uh, we are assuming that you already have some exposure to FSM. So, we know uh, that you have an idea what we are designing this FSM for not just for abstractly capturing the, uh, the, the behavior of this uh, the controller, but also to uh, demarcate which control signals will be generated which will will be asserted which will be deasserted in which state of uh, this controller. So, during decode some control signals to the data path will be activated some control signals will be deasserted and based on that the data will flow appropriately or the data will be ar archived in appropriate place. Okay. After decode okay, supposing it is a uh, if it were the uh, the uh, jump uh, instruction then after decode if the operation were jump then after decode it would go back to the fetch uh, uh, state for getting the next instruction okay so if the input condition whichever which is defined by uh, like you know the value of the signals that has been generated during the decode process if that happens to be that have indicates that it was jump instruction then uh, at end after decode state the instruction cycle would be over and we will go back into the fetch state for the next instruction to start the next instruction cycle. If it 
if operation or the instruction were not jump okay then we would definitely go into the state called ex of the controller the controller now will uh, think of itself being in the execute stage when it will try to control how the alu is to be used for uh, arithmetic operations on behalf of say add instruction or add immediate instruction or uh, use alu for uh, for like generating the uh, memory addresses using the base register contents and the immediate offset so uh, so controller would be in the ex state uh, for most of the instructions excepting jump in the third clock cycle if it goes in the third clock cycle that's what i'm uh, depicting here after ex certain instructions can certain kind of instructions would have finished the instruction cycle for example a uh, conditional branch conditional branch we can uh, arrange the data path and control signals in such a way that we'll be able to uh, we know that the conditional branch uh, all that we need to do is uh, uh, done and we can uh, commit the results and go back to the go to the next instruction so if it is some kind of branch instruction which is conditional branch jump is the unconditional jump then at the end of x uh, execute stage uh, we would arrange to commit the results what would be the kind of results in case of uh, conditional branch instruction the result that we have computed is just the target address where to jump to which the address of the next instruction to fetch that is the all that result is and where it does it need to be committed it would get committed into the program counter no other register is going to be updated no other memory location is going to be updated uh, when the operation was a branch conditional branch instruction okay because in the execute stage uh, it would uh, like try to see check whether the condition is true or not whether the the operands were equal to each other or not in case of branch if equal to in case of branch if not equal to a branch negative it will check operand values and do comparison or whatever so that is what it would have done in the prior clock cycle in the decode phase itself it would have prepared what should be the tentative target address uh, so at the end of this three clock cycles of work it would have got all the information to decide uh, precisely where to jump to either to jump to the next uh, instruction itself or to jump to uh, an instruction specified by the target address okay so this is how uh, like st state transition would take place under some other situations so now if if the uh, op code were not branch we are in an instruction execute stage of an instruction if the op, op code were not branch uh, and also let's say it were also not and of course we are not uh, uh, load no uh, okay after ex stage uh, where do we go uh, i think uh, yeah sorry if the op code were not branch and if the op code were, uh, were sorry alu type like you know add instruction or like uh, add immediate and so on if this is this was the situation that we found ourselves in the controller found itself in then it would go to what like you know after completing the execution of alu type instruction which is done inside the alu the alu results are out where do we go we go to the stage called write back the state called write back okay this is where we'll go and in this state the results of alu uh, would be picked up and put in appropriate uh, appropriate uh, register which is chosen by the instructions uh, some bits of the instruction okay and after write back it will go to it will go to start the next instruction 
Okay. So, this will happen if uh, at the end of the E x state we have the opcode was we have the controller found that it was not a branch instruction, but it was an ALU kind of instruction add instruction or set less than or whichever instruction which would have computed the results and now which will be ready to write back the result into a register file an appropriate register. Then the next state would be W B. Okay. So, this is how the state diagram is going to evolve. I am not giving the complete state diagram, it will be slightly more complicated than this. We still have to consider other situations like we have looked at two possibilities out of A x state if the opcode were branch. First of all, we will be in the A x state only if opcode were not jump, it were not unconditional jump. Okay. And if we are in the A x state, then there are possibilities like is it a branch instruction, in which case at the end of A x state we know that uh, we will be committing the program counter with uh, appropriate like address of the next instruction uh, to execute or uh, and will be uh, and will be done the instruction cycle will be over. If this opcode were not branch, but it were uh, ALU then we just have one st stage to one more sub operation to uh, take care of that is write back. Okay. There is no memory access required in uh, this kind of situation. So, we will have to modify this uh, state machine further to handle other possibilities out of EX state. The, those possibilities are if it is a if we are a load or a store memory kind of instruction. Let us see just to uh, as an exercise how this uh, FSM evolves. So, uh, like you know we had this uh, uh, fetch state unconditionally uh, like you know in just on the when the next clock cycle starts we go into the decode state v meaning the controller then uh, if it were jump instruction then we we know that the instruction cycle is over and we go back to the beginning of the next instruction cycle that is starting with fetch instruction uh, fetch uh, or sub operation uh, so, otherwise we go to E x stage right that is not jump. I am just using very loose notation like assuming that we have familiarity with designing finite state machines from earlier course or from computer architecture whatever you might have seen and then there, uh, there are under some uh, condition that is if it were branch instruction conditional branch the instruction cycle is over if it were not branch but okay uh, but ALU type instruction then all that remains to be done is write back and then the instruction cycle is over but now we have situation like if neither branch nor ALU type, but uh, load or store, okay, something like that load or store. So, if it is a load or store instruction, then we uh, this next sub operation would be something that accesses memory. So, the controller will go in a state and in this state controller will generate some uh, uh, some control signals which will control appropriate operation to happen inside the memory. So, in case of load instruction the memory is to be read in case of store, store instruction the memory is to be written with appropriate data. Okay. So, now uh, if, if it were a store instruction memory access itself is a commitment uh, uh, like uh, sub operation because uh, in case of store instruction once memory is written the instruction processing can be regarded to be over okay everything that the instruction had to do is done but if it were a load instruction opcode were load then we have to go to uh, sorry we have to go to this right back stage or write back sub operation because what we have read out from the memory uh, in case of load instruction that has to be now committed into 
a chosen specified register in the register file. So, that would happen uh, for that to happen the controller would go into this state write back state from within which it will generate appropriate clock sig signals to, uh, to uh, like you know to instruct the register file to latch or to register the data that is coming from memory into a specified register. A specified register would be enabled, other registers would be disabled and the data that is coming into from memory, data memory would be uh, put in that enabled register okay. and so on. So, now you believe that we have a rough picture of what is happening inside this FSM. Okay. Uh, to complete the picture, we need to really specify uh, how all the control signals are uh, asserted or deasserted and when, whether they are more type outputs which depend purely on the state or they are also based on the current inputs melee type outputs. Based on that, further annotation of this uh, FSM diagram will be done and we will get a complete picture. When we work out something in detail in one of the later classes for uh, like synthesis oriented uh, description. Uh, implementation oriented description which we can test it out on FPGA, implement and test on FPGA. We will uh, make a uh, at that time we will do the exercise completely and describe this FSM in a full in the full glory. Okay. Here this is only for the sake of getting uh, a picture of it okay. uh, because we need to go and now uh, like revisit data path aspects of uh, this design. So, anyway like uh, you also recall that while talking about single cycle, we did not have to talk about such an FSM which, uh, which is not too complex, but still it had so many states. Of course, even there in a single cycle implementation of CPU, every during every instruction processing, uh, there was a sub operation fetch, decode, execute or whatever, but they were not happening on clock boundaries. They were all happening, uh, all of them were happening together inside a single clock cycle. Okay. So, uh, there must have been some price to pay for that of course, the uh, long clock cycle that means slower design plus there was one more one more price we paid which we did not realize at that time, but now we will see that in using this F multi cycle approach we will be able to save on resources we will see how. <coughs> so, uh, 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 to understand what is the related data path for or multi cycle uh, implementation or design and implementation of micro MIPS or mini MIPS. This is slide number I think 8. We will uh, take a stock, we will try to uh, see what we need in our inventory to, uh, to prepare the data path what or which components or which kind of components required. Of course, we require register for storing program counter or which sorry, which data path components. We require program counter definitely, we require like before ALU in absolutely indispensable then we require uh, memory to store instruction and data. Uh, note that in case of uh, a single cycle we require separate uh, instruction memory and separate data memory because we assume that the memory has only single port and because in case of single cycle data path we, we had to access instruction uh, memory for both instruction and data cycle. Uh, data in the same clock cycle, which is not possible in a or for single ported memories, we had to have separate uh, blocks for instruction memory and se separate block for data memory. But here we will be able to show that uh, we will be able to time multiplex a single block of memory for accessing instructions as well as accessing reading writing data. Okay. So, we will see that single memory for i and data okay that's one of going to be one of the resource optimization which would be feasible because of multi cycle approach 
you probably already have an intuition about why, but yes, we'll go through it anyway. What about uh, what about the uh, other things like you know, data instruction memory, ALU, PC, register file, of course, which has uh, which hosts 32 registers for our uh, like to facilitate our uh, instruction set architecture, where we could use as many as 32 registers, a, a file or a, a block of so many registers that stored in this. Uh, so called register file which is a standard data path component. Uh, what do we need more? Okay. We might uh, like in the single cycle data path we require several ALUs uh, to do de different things like you know to, uh, uh, to compute PC plus 4, program counter value plus 4, to compute target address or branch instructions or like you know uh, Typically, we require the ALU for computing the uh, memory addresses or the addresses of the ALU type instruction or, or the result of the ALU type instructions. So, multiple ALU, ALUs were uh, used, or uh, some of them were weak, simple ALUs just used as adders, some of them were just maybe shift, uh, maybe simple, simpli more simplified adders, customized adders, but they were ALU. Uh, you can regard them as like some data path components of the ALU type. Here, we will be able to show that again we can optimize on the resources and use a single ALU for instead of using three different uh, such arithmetic components, single ALU will suffice in case of multi cycle uh, implementation. That is again a big evidence of uh, a big plus for multi cycle implementation resource optimization. Yeah, so, other than that do we need more? So, there must be some uh, typically cost to pay and what uh, we might need something more and that more that we did not require in case of single cycle data path, uh, this will require for storing or registering results of sub operations. Okay. Let us understand what we mean by that we require something more, something more in the data path for storing the results of sub operations. You know. This uh, the what we the data path or registers or memory that we used in uh, single cycle implementation was uh, used for archiving the results only at the end of the instruction cycle, the, uh, when the instruction is fully executed. Whereas, now we are going to instru execute instructions in sub cycles in more than typically more than one. 2, 3, 4, 5 sub uh, clock cycles. And so, a, a sub operation will be happening in uh, a given clock cycle. So, the sub operations results also have to be archived, have to be stored for later use in some registers. You can, uh, it is fair amount of common sense intuition to see why we need to do like you know store the results in registers even. Uh, like for this intermediate sub operations, because otherwise if we were to leave them on the sig signals without registering them, they might get overwritten by uh, some changes to it at a later time during the instruction uh, cycle. So, it is always a good practice like whenever you have a result of a sub operation ready, latch it or register it into some registers and for that we will require more, some more registers other than P PC and a set of registers in register file. Third, okay. Hopefully, that cost will uh, not be too much, we will see exactly how much, but whatever we will go ahead with it. So, we are saying that our data path would have a program counter uh, ready to, which can supply uh, address to the memory for fetching an instruction. Okay. Then uh, and this memory will uh, will be able to kind of will establish or will convince you that uh, I will convince you that this memory can hold both data and instruction. We do not need separate instruction memory and separate data memory. There is a register file which holds 32 registers each one of 32 bits on the data path, there will be an ALU on the data path as before as in the single cycle, there we require multiple small uh, one ALU and couple of other smaller adders 
anything else? Uh, no, this seems to be the thing that we need from our experience with single cycle data path, but I am saying that now we need something more. So, what that more is? Uh, we will need something, this memory is being used for both instruction and data. So, uh, in certain clock cycle, this memory's output is going to be okay. The input, one of the input uh, to the memory as an address is the contents of program counter. There is another possibility of supplying an address to memory, but this is one possibility. And when uh, address comes from program counter, the interpretation of what comes out of memory is something that is an instruction and that we will like to store it into a, a register called IR. Okay. So, in the in the fetch inst, uh, fetch sub cycle when program counter uh, contents are used as address to the memory, the output of memory the data output of memory is at the end of that fetch instruction sub cycle the clock cycle the contents of uh, memory are going to be loaded into IR. So, we are going to use uh, a new register called IR. Okay. Similarly, at uh, in some other situations like in some other uh, sub operations for example, in the sub operation loads uh, sub operation memory access sub operation of the load instruction, wherein the memory uh, will be read out into we will need to read out memory for some data which, which has to be subsequently uh, latched or registered into one of the chosen registers of the register file. Okay. So, we will have uh, a register called memory data register in addition to the other registers other data path components. Okay. Now, you see that common memory is being used, but at some time the output of memory is stored in instruction register at in some other at some other appropriate time the output of memory is going to be stored in memory data register which we know is later required to be fed into register file. I am not drawing the diagram uh, like you know I am not aiming at a final diagram I am just like as the ideas evolve I am going to uh, sketch uh, the connections. Okay. Uh, that is a no normal way of designing such uh, architectures. We okay, what else? So, we have seen the need for these two extra registers. Similarly, you might kind of perceive that you would require uh, this pair of 32 bit numbers which come out of register file which are the two operands uh, for say addition instruction. They, be, uh, they are the results of uh, the decode, decode sub cycle wherein the register is being uh, register file is being read for operands. And For that also we will uh, make use of to store uh, the contents being read out of the register file, we will use a pair of registers A and B called A and B. Uh, so, that the, uh, the results of the decode sub operation are archived in this. Okay. Similarly, to archive to store the results of an ALU or execute sub operation, we will take the output of ALU and put it in a register called ALU result, ALU res result. Okay. So, this is another one that we will use. Okay. Yeah, I mean so just let us sub, uh, summarize it again. So, more registers why and which ones? So, we have actually saved on something, we have saved on a block of memory, we have saved on a couple of adders that is we are going to uh, uh, prove that or rather uh, convince you about that, uh, but we are going to pay a bit of extra cost and that is in terms of registers. So, which ones I R, why do we require I R for storing or registering uh, 
the result of which fetch uh, fetch sub cycle. Okay. Uh, we uh, talked about MDR. MDR stands for memory data register. Why do we need this? To store result of some other sub operation. Which sub operation? Sub operation of uh, instruction sub cycle, whatever. Sub operation, which one? Memory access. Uh, during instruction cycle of it is not that every register is required for every kind of operation, MDR is going to be required only for a load word kind of instruction of load word instruction. Okay. Similarly, uh, similar to IR and MDR, we will argue uh, the purpose of A and B and uh, ALU result, which are the three more like registers that we have kind of uh, decided to use. Register A, A register and B register, where were they coming, uh, they were getting the uh, data or input from the register file. Okay. And the main purpose of them was to feed this values to the ALU inputs. Okay. Not always, not always it is going to be required, but yeah, typically that is the purpose. In fact, the ALU is going to be used for something else at some other time, but uh, whenever A and B have some meaningful values on behalf of, uh, I mean intentional values on behalf of an instruction like add, which is an ALU type instruction. The in during the execute sub cycle or sub operation, uh, this uh, will the contents of A and B will become input to the ALU uh, for doing the arithmetic. Okay. So, that is how the connections will be. So, are not only connections, I am just we are just kind of figuring out which kind of signals, how the signals might flow, the path of the signals. So, eventually in the final implementation there would not be a single wire for this, it might be like broken by multiplexer, it might be a path which might have multiplexers or routers along the way. Okay. But this is, this arrows or whatever I am drawing are indicating uh, this, the data can fl can flow or it would be required to flow in sub uh, some situations from register A to the first input of ALU. In some other situation, some situations the data would be required to flow from register B to the second input of ALU. Okay. In some other situations, some other data path would be there from somewhere else to the first input of ALU and some, in some other situations there could be some other data path uh, coming from some other source to the second input of ALU. Okay. So, all that can happen and so for that naturally we will be using multiplexers to do this routing selection of data sources and so on. The last register that we uh, uh, plan to use was uh, is, stash, is kind of kept at the output of uh, the ALU to archive the result of to store result of EX execute sub operation. Okay. All these registers are clocked. So, in fact, I could kind of have this uh, triangle indicating that they are clocked on the rising edge of the clocks provided we are using uh, positive edge or rising edge uh, edge trigger discipline. So, uh, 
we just made an inventory of uh, the extra registers that would require because we are now taking the multi cycle approach IR, MDR, IR for instruction register, MDR memory data register, A and B registers and ALU result. And we justified I mean or other like why we need them at what time they will be of use, they will be used to store the results and we are given some rough picture and uh, this was kind of based on the rough uh, like finite state machine that we had designed rough picture of the finite state machine that that is the basis uh, heart of the controller. By the way, I just uh, I realized that okay, and I did not claim it to be complete, but one of the things that I missed out here was uh, consider the memory access for the store instruction. If it is a store instruction after the memory access, after writing into the memory, we are done. The store instruction is finished, right. So, after that it will go here that is if the if the instruction were store instruction, then after the memory access that is memory write the instruction cycle is over and we the controller would go to the fetch uh, sub cycle or fetch sub operation of the, for the next instruction cycle. Okay. Whereas, if it, after memory access if it were a load instruction then memory access must have been uh, doing the job of reading something from the memory and then you would have to like go to a state where what has been read out from the memory is now written into a register appropriately chosen register of the register file that is in the write back state. And the load instruction would only then be over and instruction cycle finish and uh, then the controller will go to the fetch sub uh, state of the next instruction cycle. Okay. So, just looking at the loads, load instruction cycle, load instruction cycle starts in the state fetch, then it uh, does the decoding work, when it, it also reads the operands from the register file, then it like in the execute state the fetch uh, the load instruction would compute the memory address, then it would go to memory access state in which it would give itself time give the data part time to read out the contents of the memory and then the contents which have been read out from the memory are going to be uh, registered in, in appropriate place in the register file that is in set WB state and then the instruction cycle is over and the controller will uh, go back to the fetch state of the next uh, will resume fetch state of the next instruction cycle. Okay. In case of jump uh, sequence of states tra transitions is that from fetch you go to decode independent of any instruction and if it were a jump uh, condition unconditional jump instruction in the decode uh, state itself the program counter would be modified at the end of decode state the program counter would have been modified with the target address that have been extracted out of the instruction which has been decoded. So, the jump instructions instruction cycle is over once these two states are finished, two sub cycles, two clock cycles are over. For branch there will be f d e x, for store there will be f d e x m a and this and so on. So, we can trace the behavior of different instruction cycles for different kinds of instruction using this f s m. I believe it is complete. So, anyway we will see a very detailed picture when we arrive at a stage where we are going to implement like this and writes a very log code or target FPJ for implementation of this. So, uh, let us like you know try to get more details of the data path. FSM we just had a relook at In the data path this program counter, the program counter is has the access uh, address can provide access to memory okay. from memory we can fill up this uh, contents of memory can be used to fill up this IR register you know in 
which sub, sub operation or which uh, state this IR will be updated that would be in the fetch state. Whereas, in some other state for some other instruction this m d r okay, memory data register is going to be used for registering the contents of memory. Which state? It would be the memory access state of a load instruction and for all other instructions which are not of that kind load or its variants this will be of no use. It will not be having any meaningful purpose, but it has to be there because uh, in some situations it is required. So, we cannot help it. Then there is a register file. And the sizes are not uh, proportionate, right? just do not worry about that. What is coming as input to register file RF I call it. The input to the register file are like you know uh, as we seen in the single cycle data path, we require some bits of uh, instructions to arrive here and okay. this pair of 5 bits if you recall were used as indices of the registers which have which are which are to be read out whose contents are to be read out on this 32 bit wires. Okay. So, this 5 bits and this 5 bits are going to specify to a pair of 5 bit indices to, uh, to indicate which registers are to be read out on this output or and on this output. Okay. And in some situations some of these bits are to be interpreted as the index of the destination register where like in case of load instruction the data which has been read out from memory has to be archived in. Okay. So, one more set of bits will indicate the destination register index. I am not giving a detailed picture here, it will be too clumsy to, to clutter to bring it out, it's just the overall concept and the details will be clear later on anyway. What is the purpose of this MDR? Where will it be used? It would be used to provide data input to uh, say write data. I need not write this, I think you I am going to leave it to you to guess what, what is uh, where the signals are going from that is clear this signal is going from MDR, but to what which port of RF register file it goes to. Here I have kind of given the answer explicitly, it will go to a write data port, these are 32 bit lines. Okay. So, when will this happen, this transfer happen, this will happen, this will be arranged uh, to happen inside a write back state of load word instruction cycle. All right. In some other case, this uh, write data port of register file would be used, uh, would get fed from would get a so, uh, data from some other source possibly, uh, but this is one possible source of data for this. Then we have this, uh, we decided to use A and register B. Okay. And then this is falling short of space. I will just draw a very narrow ALU. Okay. And uh, this is one possibility of data flow into the two inputs of ALU. The ALU's output goes to the ALU out register, ALU result, sorry. Okay. This is ALU result okay. and we will we'll be wondering where the output of this register go, we will come to that. Just think of as a hint, it is to go somewhere else in more than one place maybe. Yeah. So, uh, PC uh, has to get input from somewhere, right? from where, what is the input to PC? the updated program counter value 
and uh, it is always the result of like it is yeah it can come from couple of sources. For example, it can come come out from ADU's output or it can come out from instruction uh, instruction register itself. Okay. So, can we try and work out the picture of where this can come from at least one possibility. So, typically uh, what is getting loaded into PC uh, program counter uh, PC plus 4 and where is that PC plus 4 available? It is going to be available at the output of ALU okay. and how is that PC plus 4 generated? To generate PC plus 4 through the ALU, we will have to feed this program counters program counters output we will have to arrange to feed it as a one possible source of ALU's first input and we will have to feed uh, like a, a number 4 here at the second input. So, P c plus 4 under some uh, situation this will become the output to the first port of ALU, this will become the uh, sorry this will become the input to the first port of ALU, this will become the input to the second port of ALU, P c plus 4 will be computed will be available here and in the same clock cycle we want to uh, arrange to take this output and uh, keep it ready to be loaded at the end of the clock cycle into the program counter. This program counter is edge triggered. Okay. So, in that means in the fetch sub cycle what would be happening is that P c contents are read out in the I am talking about a, any typical fetch cycle fetch sub operation fetch sub operation. Okay. In the fetch sub operation uh, the contents of P c are being provided as register to memory element uh, memory uh, block and the output of memory block are are fed to this instruction register at the end of the clock cycle for fetch the instruction register is going to be uh, going to get updated with the contents of memory. So, the instruction re register will henceforth contain that particular instruction which has which was at this address. Furthermore, during the fetch clock cycle this program counter will be also fed to uh, ALU as the first input and the second input to the ALU would be fed as this this number 4 constant 4 will be fed to it. So, P c plus 4 will be computed and the uh, ALU will be configured as an adder. So, P c plus 4 will be uh, available here and that is brought back here. Note that I am not bringing this back from the ALU out, uh, result register. It is before it gets latched into the register I am taking it directly. So, this is all happening in the single clock cycle from this register through the combinational ALU back to this register or and and also like through this uh, from this register to the mem memory and uh, asynchronous read and writing into this register. So, there are this two flip flop to flip flop kind of paths state element to state element paths okay, here and this. So, this kind of data flow is happening during the fetch uh, sub cycle of any instruction uh, cycle. Okay. So, please make a note that this is going P c plus 4 is coming from here not from here that would be available only in the next clock cycle. So, but whereas P c has to be updated in the fetch cl clock cycle itself. Okay. So, now, we see that uh, we need some multiplexers here. We have already seen the need, we just seen the need that the first input to ALU can typically would typically come from the A register or could come from P c. In fact, early in the instruction cycle, the first input to ALU always comes from P c because we have to compute P c plus 4 and keep it ready to be latched into this P c, registered into the P c at the end of that clock cycle very early is right. And uh, second in input to the ALU at that kind of time is required to be this constant 4. On the other hand most typically second input to the ALU comes from the B register. 
do not worry about this clutter, we will redraw it for different situations. Okay. And you have these diagrams very easily available in texts and so on. So, what we are, I am emphasizing here is how do we evolve this uh, from scratch. All right. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, the point what I am making was making is that we'll need multiplexers here. We'll need something like uh, okay, a multiplexer to feed into the first input of ALU okay, and typically uh, the contents of A will be fed will be routed through the multiplexer in uh, to the first input of ALU or in some cases it is a PC which will be contents of PC will be routed uh, to the first input of ALU. Okay. So, this is the this what I have drawn here is a kind of blown up version of this picture. Okay. Clear? Just stare at it for a while. Okay. So, uh, need for multiplexers on data path. So, that is now clear we will need more and more of this multiplexers. We need a multiplexer here because there are two possibilities either the second input will get either the data from B register or will get that constant 4 in some other situation in some other clock cycle. right? So, provision has to be there in appropriate clock cycles the multiplexer will route appropriate input to its output that is a router. Okay. Yeah, what else can we add to this diagram? Yeah, uh, let us look at some other kind of signals. Uh, we are curious about uh, what is happening this is that ALU result. And we have kind of tentatively drawn that the output of this ALU result uh, register is going to be required somewhere else where ALU result uh, would be required in case of uh, instruction like add this is reg file and this is that uh, write port to which typically uh, sometimes not typically sometimes MDR will be feeding to it, but at some other uh, in some other st uh, situations it will be the result of ALU that is to be uh, that is to be uh, written into the appropriate register of this register file. Okay. So, this data flow um, required for W B of which instruction write back of uh, say add instruction okay add instruction cycle okay so whereas this this data flow this uh, signal flow would be used for uh, used in the W B uh, state or W B state of load load word instruction, whatever the mnemonic for that is, okay. Load the instruction cycle of that. All right. So again, a mux is required. A mux required. Okay. So that shows the need for something like this. So, we I mean you know we have been kind of trying to evolve uh, the data path architecture of multi cycle CPU and we have we made an inventory of what data path components we require. We realize that this is it is going to be done in terms of sub operations at different clock cycles. We are going to require more uh, some more uh, registers like IR, MDR, AB 
and uh, and there'll be uh, signals flowing uh, like in certain uh, from cert certain sources to certain destinations so that we have also tried to capture most of it uh, most of the data path we have kind of figured out in this figure as well and in addition with this figure there are still couple of uh, uh, details left couple of you know data flow signal flow wires left here you can think of it think over it on your own as an exercise we'll anyway complete it in the next uh, uh, when i resume so fortunately this multi cycle data path is not in fact it is slightly tidier than the single cycle data path that you would see okay so just that it's not fitting in too well here we'll get a well designed figure and show you all of it but what we have done so far is to show you the evolution of it how is the thought process behind designing such a multi cycle data path i hope it has been okay